I mean, just before we came from home, I'm sure there was something we disturbed us or we spoke something rudely to someone, but we are normal, so it's understood as a bad day or a bad mood. But I'm so proud of Indira, seriously. She has given her... She has dedicated her life to this and uh, not without the support of an amazing husband, Dharmil. So, I'm really proud that I'm a part of this Gateway School and congratulations, Indira, and the staff. The staff is amazing here. I'm, I'm, I mean, the school wouldn't be the way it is because it, without the staff. So congratulations for celebrating 10 years. That was a few months ago. And uh, it's just amazing. It started with 22 kids, and now there are more than 100 kids. And it's just, wow. It's the, it's, it's the, it has been recognized as one of the best schools in the world. And that's the reason why the Utah University wants to join hands with them and giving pies, trying, you know, they're part of that. And, you know, it's so important, you know, because they have to recognize and they want to come. I mean, everybody wants to do good, but people don't, they start these institutes, they start these schools, but they do not personally give them the energy and the, the, the time to it. They think they're doing a good cause, but are they really looking into how it's been taken care of, how it's been worked, how, what programs, what are they trying to do with the kids. In this school, every kid is personally attended to and looked into as to what they are capable of and try to train them as to how they can face the world, you know, and give them that confidence. And, you know, and I mean, I'm worried about my kids, so I'm, I mean, it's the same for these kids, you know, so it's amazing. I mean, I'm just so happy to be here and I'm so glad to see so many people here and I mean, some of us out here are parents of these children and they are so happy with how their kids have progressed in life so thank you so much for having me here Indira. Okay next up is Tim, Tim your okay next up Tim sir uh, tell us in mo not more than 30 seconds why you feel myself as an ally from an equity and inclusion perspective um, I've been working in this field for 30 years supporting people with disabilities and thinking about how we include people with disabilities. And I still see people being segregated and isolated simply because of their disability and the stereotypes about disability. And we haven't fully supported the full range of opportunities for people with disabilities in their community, employment, and residential areas. And so I really view uh, my role as an ally to people with disabilities, just, just to promote the idea of equity and inclusion for people with disabilities. Okay, Trisha, your turn. Uh, tell us in not more than 30 seconds why you feel passionate about an ally with people with disabilities or slash special abilities. Thank you. So my passion really comes from, I'm a family member. So I have an aunt and a cousin with varying disabilities. So just kind of growing up in my family, it was something that I was comfortable around. Um, and I don't think I realized the level of um, segregation or what services or how the system worked because my family members weren't in it um, in, in the United States. And so when I went to college and um, started working directly with people, I just, it really was just my passion. Um, and employment is really that thing that um, it's an equalizer, right? We typically ask people what they do for a living, and so just wanting people to have that same opportunity to be proud of what they do every day and the joy that I get from work, um, wanting to help people be able to, to experience that for themselves is really where my passion comes from. So thanks for having me. Very good. Okay, Mr. Sadish, tell us in not more than 30 seconds why you feel passionate about being an ally to people with disabilities slash special abilities. Warm good evening to everyone. So, I am a firm believer of having everyone with equal opportunity for employment per se or for uh, to live in society, in normal society as we all are there. So, to, so to avoid uh, something which makes them different and take out that stigma out of uh, normal and not normal uh, individual 
we ensure that everyone who joins us for training we ensure that who everyone who wants to work maybe for understanding maybe honing their skills we take them and we train them accordingly so that is what i would suggest thank you okay let's start with round 1 as a nice thing say a question tell us in not more than 30 seconds why you feel passionate about being ally with people to people with disabilities slash special abilities okay sir mahesh sir i think there's a struggle okay, it's going to be fine it's uh, it's going to be fine okay let's start with round 1 garden as a parent what gaps do you have you noticed in the education system is there a great awareness to accommodate children with special needs and what do you think needs to be done differently to address some of these gaps? Yeah. Sorry, it's called the get with gaps. The education system is something that uh, I, in India I am supremely passionate about and sometimes very disappointed with also. Uh, yeah, I have to say that. Um, because I feel that one of the major things that uh, we have in our education system is the fact that we teach our children to mug everything. And uh, everything, is, uh, everything is based, your grade, everything is based on the fact that can you recite like a parrot. Whether you get a 98% or a 50% is all relevant on how well you can write whatever is written in the textbook as is without actually putting your brain to use or uh, without actually you know, understanding what you are actually writing. So yes, that is my <laughs> major grouse with the educational system. But, uh, but yes, I think there are lots of things that Thank you for sharing. I'm not finished. <laughs> oh, sorry, sorry. I'm on my soapbox. Don't stop me. <laughs> I won't let you talk. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, but yes, I think one of you know uh, one of the things like like I said before, I think one of the major things that we teach our children, and like my son keeps asking me, he's like, Mom, you're sending me to school. Why do I have to go to school? And this is my basic answer to him which uh, I think the first time I said it to him, I think he had to go find a dictionary to understand exactly what I was saying. So I was like, you know, you have to understand that the reason that I'm sending you to school is not for you to get good marks, is not for you to learn history, geography, maths. I'm sending you to school to understand society. I'm sending you to school to understand how to integrate yourself into society. I'm sending you to a good school so that you understand what what everybody is like that there are all different kinds of people in this world that you're going to meet and school is the first step for every child to understand that so yes we had lots of topics um, uh, you know when i was a kid for about <clears throat> two years in the middle while i was studying we had something called moral science which i would look at it and i was like why am i learning moral science i mean like it's, it was like reading Aesop's fables or something like that. And you know, you're like, you're like so, and I, that was in seventh grade. I'm like, please give me a break. But I think kids today, kids today somewhere down the line need something like that to be inculcated into the system. It cannot only be about history, geography, maths. 
we have to teach them about the world. We have to put programs into place in our schools and make them understand, as they say, people with disabilities as well should be integrated into our schools. And the children should be taught from a much younger age that this is normal. That these people, these are children, these are normal, normal children and you get to play with them and you know you can, um, you know you have to share your books with them and uh, they are a part of society, not apart from society. And, um, and I think that one of the basic things that we miss out in our education system is, uh, you know, we had the Gurukul system at one point in time in our country. And in the Gurukul system, I remember thinking that, wow, what a system, because it had, it was a combination of mind, body and spirit. And um, in today's schools, I wish we could do something like that, where they could concentrate on the mind, body and spirit and children could be judged according to all these three parameters and not just one parameter. So yes, now I'm done. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Okay. Let's have Bobby here. What has been your journey as your advisor to Gateway School Mumbai? What are moments that we have inspired you on the school journey? And why do you think institutions like Gateway are critical to enabling children like with special needs realize their potential? I guess I've already said that earlier, but uh, it's just that, uh, I mean, I don't know anything about the education system. I mean, I was like, wow, Kajol, you know a lot. And uh, it's amazing. I mean, I hated studying. Okay. I didn't have any special skills because I used to wonder the same thing. Why do I have to study every subject? And I think it goes the same for every child. I think Gateway is just amazing the way they've approached this. You can't hear me? Okay. Oh, I can. Okay. So, I mean, it's just amazing how Gateway has, what they've done with the kids in their school, they work personally with every child and improve their skill sets and try to identify what they're good at. And I think that's exactly what's required, even for normal kids. Because what is the point of educating yourself or grasping everything around you when eventually you don't need everything? You know, I mean, general knowledge is something you get with mingling with the society and understanding society. And what's the most important thing is how do you survive in a society because they have too many norms and rules and the way you behave in your life. I think every child should grow up to be independent, fearless of how the society thinks and do exactly what they believe. And I think that's the most important thing every child should be taught. Because if you live according to society, you'll never be able to reach or get the happiness and satisfaction of what you really want to achieve in life. And I think Gateway especially, because it's for special needs kids and for disability, I think it's done an awesome job. And I think other schools in India should make this as an example and follow the way they work and create more support system for schools like this. I think the government should look into it and really help because this is an honest institute, this is an honest school, this is an honest way everybody's trying to do something. There is no ulterior motive, there's no profit, there's no benefit. The benefit, yes. The benefit is that you're giving these kids a brighter future. I think that's the most important thing. Thank you, Bobby Hill. Okay, next up, Tim and A lot of time uh, working with employers and thinking uh, about how we engage employers. And several of the things that we've learned over the years is that um, uh, several of the things that we've learned over the years is that uh, there's several themes that emerge in the employment world. First of all, uh, people believe that employers believe that people with disabilities can't work, um, and that's universal. That's across the board. Uh, and we know through years of research and years of programs such as supported employment and customized employment. That, that really dispels that myth that people with disabilities can't work. Um, supported employment was one of the earlier models that, that we've used to help people with disabilities obtain competitive integrated employment. And what we started to see with supported employment is uh, it was working for a subset of individuals with the disabilities, but oftentimes people with more significant disabilities weren't obtaining jobs. And so that's why we have customized employment, and I think that's what the gateway, that's what the gateway school is trying to uh, implement is this idea of customized employment to help support people with more significant disabilities obtain jobs. And we know one of the predictors of maintaining a job for a person with a disability is finding the match. 
and finding an appropriate match. So we match the skills and interests of an individual with a disability to the job. And oftentimes, what happens in the employment world or when we're supporting people with disabilities, we forget about the match. We just want to get a job. And then we start to place people in jobs based off stereotype. So in the United States, we talk about the F jobs for people with disabilities. And these F jobs are what we call fast food, flowers, and filth. Meaning we tend to put people in jobs that we think they can do, or th those are the only jobs that we can do. And we know through, through customized employment and supported employment that there's a range of work that people with disabilities can do. Another thing that we kind of see with misconceptions about hiring of people with disabilities is that people with disabilities, and especially people with intellectual developmental disabilities, more significant disabilities are a liability to the workforce. And we know once again through research over the years that that's just not true. Oftentimes when we train a person with a disability to work in a job that matches his or her skill skill set, their safety record is often better than those without people with disabilities. Um, so th this liability issue is just, it's, it's a myth that's out there. Um, the second part of the question was, how do we move forward? Um, or what, and some of the misconceptions maybe when we're moving forward, if I recall. Um, here's something that's very universal. I've, I've worked in different countries thinking about employment and I think one of the universal truths about supporting people with disabilities or what people believe about people with disabilities is that they can't work and that they have low expectations for what people with disabilities can do and that there are stereotypes about people with disabilities. And I think this really stems from our notion of disability and I think this is a really important point to stress as we start to think about how we can build employment programs for people with disabilities. And this notion kind of comes from this idea, when we think about disability, we always think it's an us-them paradigm, right? We think, oh, we, have a, we don't have a disability, and then there are people with disabilities, and we're separate. What we know is that disability is a part of the human condition. It's something that everybody in this room will have at some point. Um, and so I think if we can work out this idea that you know, some people will have disability at birth, some people will have disability later on at life, some people will have a disability old and when they're when they're aging and older. Or, you know, I could leave this room tonight and get in a car. I've experienced Mumbai traffic now. Uh, I can get in get in a car and get in an accident and acquire a brain injury. So unlike any other form of marginalized group, I can enter the disability field. And I think or the, and become a person with a disability. So I think as we start thinking about disability and supporting people with disabilities, if we can change the lens and the framework of thinking about disability and look at it as a we instead of an us and them paradigm, I think we might be more rece receptive to uh, supporting people with disabilities and employing people with disabilities in the range of occupations that are available. Thank you. That would be good, sir. Okay, Teacher Joan Parkin, could you share more about the path-breaking employment first priority legislation in the USA and the impact that has created since? What could be lessons that could borrow, India could borrow from what works? Okay, so the Employment First initiative um, in the United States started, gosh, 2007, 2008, and um, it started with a handful of states that passed um, legislation. And now, today, there's 39 states that have some form of legislation or executive order. That, so that really is directing a lot of funding priorities at the state level. And then what has happened is that there's been more of a federal um, level of support to, to help those states implement. So in terms of the momentum and excitement around Employment First, it certainly, I think, re-energized um, a lot of that movement and excitement that happened in the early or in the early '90s with supported employment. What we saw was, you know, there, people were getting jobs, and there's been a big lull in the United States. And so, this employment first movement certainly generated that interest and discussion about 
everybody has a, should have opportunities to work, including people with the most significant disabilities. So in terms of lessons learned, there was kind of this big rush to say, we're an employment first state, but people didn't really think it through in terms of how do we make this last? How do we make this stick? And who are we going to be accountable to? So those are the kinds of things that really make an impact in um, numbers or policies or people really having those opportunities is having bodies of decision makers or whoever is putting up the funding to say what is it that we want to fund and what, what do we want to see happen and measure those things and have those outlines of expectations. I believe that's where there's been some shortfall in the United States around Employment First. And then you see states where there's been really good progress and it's because they've measured and put, for lack of a better word, money where their mouth is. Saying we care about employment, we want people to be employed, what are the things that we need? So I think those would be my, kind of those lessons learned is, um, you know, really matching what you say it is that you want and uh, funding those initiatives. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Sajish. From your own lived experience of championing employment for people with disabilities at the workplace, could you share us how can employees, employers in India create and benefit from more inclusive workplace? What are the challenges you face in this regard and how did you overcome them? So, yeah. so coming on to the challenges part first, I feel when you employ uh, employ these kids or PWD candidates, so there is a potential biasness is there with the people who are working with them. They are for sure they will have uh, unsure, uh, uh, I would say, uh, guarantees from them that they would carry out this work or no. So that potential biasness you cannot remove. And secondly, I would feel there is a there would be misconception from them that they their capabilities may not be that they will complete the particular workforce so to avoid all this uh, kind of you know uh, confusion or potential biasness what we did is we have had a mentor assigned with everyone which were engaged at our facility so starting from their entrance until they check out from the facility. We ensured that mentor takes the responsibility. We sensitize that mentor. We let them know what is their responsibility towards these kids or towards these employees and how should they be treated at workplace. So they may not be perfect in every aspect and we made ensure that our senior member would take repetitive rounds of that areas would assist the performance after every week or three days initially and we were so dependent on these kids that uh, Rajdeep, Krish, we really miss them at workplace, their vibrancy, their uh, so they were kind of part of our team, they were kind of part of our family so we work there as family of course so at uh, we were as in, uh, we saw them sitting in cafeteria for one hour don't know what they were doing so then we had to ask supervisor where are they and what are they doing so by this way we slowly slowly improvised our uh, processes to have them at workplace train them on particular skills and they can be assisted going forward so that was it thank you thank you sir Okay, let's switch to round two. We're moving on to rapid fire round. Let's try asking the question again. What is the current scenario where the law and right, police? Uh, huh? Sorry, you were saying? Uh, is it, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Can you, yes, you can hear us. Or am I speaking? Of, it's to consist of professionals trained to assist people with disabilities, like special educators and clinical psychologists. The most important thing is that the 22 policy aims to create a national database of, of persons with disabilities and link the data so that the glitch is not, not, not of my doing. And by the way, I just want to answer the first question. The first question that was posed, right, 
as to why one is passionate about this. One is passionate because one is really passionate about all Thank you, Mahesh, sir. Okay, now round two. We're moving on to rapid fire round. Sorry, Madam Mahesh, sir. Okay, let's start with Gajan. What role could celebrities play to influence and help mainstream the narrative that influence stakeholders around employment for persons with disabilities? Um, I think the film industry is uh, one of the passions of our country. So yes, we have a lot of uh, people who have a lot of voices. Uh, so I think that's, that's the one thing. I think we've seen uh, people standing up. We've seen Tari Zameen Pei, we've seen Black. Uh, we've done a film, I've done a film called My Name is Khan, which was about somebody who had Asperger's. So yes, we have been, uh, you know, putting it out there in the nicest way possible uh, to make the general, you know, population understand it, maybe feel a little, feel uh, more for it. And, um, and, and I said, as I said before, the reason that uh, I, I think the most that we can do is stand up and make it regular and uh, stand up and talk about it. I think it, it needs to stop... Uh, disability needs to stop being a, a word that we don't use or people that we hide away, you know, or members of the family that, uh, you know, don't come out in the parties. So I think, I think that's one of the things that uh, maybe the film industry as a voice can speak up for. Thank you, Kajan. Okay. Bobby Dio, our audience comprises of promoters, corporates, leaders of diverse fields. What's your message to all of them to move the needle on employment for people with disabilities? I guess um, I wish they understand it's not just about employment. I think they should contribute towards institutes which encourage and educate these kids so they, so they understand what they're capable of and then moving towards employment. Okay. And that is the foundation, because if you do not have a foundation, how do you give employment? Then there will always be a thing where, oh no, this is us, they're them, and it's always going to be that way. So first, they, these corporates, and all these people who have the facilities, who contribute towards charity, should use that towards creating institutes to educate kids with disability and special needs. So their skill sets could be understood, and then they can move forward in life. I mean, it's the same, like how Kajal was saying, that we need to teach and learn so much, we taught so much, and we don't understand anything. And so imagine children with disabilities, they need to... Thank you. 